Hello and welcome to Recruiter 360 TV with me, Toby Babb, and uh, today joined by Paul Glim. Paul, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks Excellent. for inviting me along. Thanks for coming in. So, um, the uh, founder of Aspiring FDs and Aristar Consulting, tell us a little bit more about what you do. So, um, as I said, I run, run two businesses. Um, Aristar Consulting provides a remote finance team for the SME recruitment sector with a real focus on the contract market and um, our kind of key differentiator is our focus on customer service. So I'm a big believer that your finance team can help you differentiate yourself and your brand in a very congested marketplace. Yeah, yeah. Um, Aspiring FDs has um, started off the back of that. I've been asked to mentor a lot of um, heads of finance in recruitment companies over the years. Um, and the remit is always the same. It's I've got this great finance person um, I think I can get more out of them, yeah. um, but I don't know how to do it. Yeah. And the finance person has worked their way up through the ranks and they just don't know how to take that step up to be a genuine board level FD. Yeah. So the course is designed around helping them to make that transition whilst also creating a really strong peer network for them. Yeah, and that's an important part of it because you know, we've, we've spoken before about this, about the, the sort of uh, benefits you get of seeing people move through a finance team. and, and uh, and having your FD effectively been in you know, your CFO ultimately, but having been brought through the ranks of, of a business, um, is that something you see, see a real benefit in? Yeah, definitely. And and for me, one of the reasons, say, so, so take a step back, I, yeah. I kind of joined the recruitment industry a bit kicking and screaming. Yeah. So I, I took a six month contract to fix an ailing finance department within a large finance recruiter. Um, and after three months, I absolutely fell in love with the industry. Yeah. Um, and for me, out of all the industries I'd worked in previously, I think you can have more impact, more commercial impact as a finance person in recruitment yeah. than in any of the other industries I've worked in previously. Which, which, which other industries have you seen? Uh, so I started my career in, in practice. I, yeah. wor I worked for a, for a top 20 accountancy practice yeah. um, with quite a focus on financial services and shipping uh, and property. Um, I then spent some time in advertising, um, and before I got into recruitment, I was FD for a coffee company yeah. uh, that sold out to a large corporate, which put me on the market, and yeah. how, how I ended up talking to recruiters. Yeah, yeah, and, they, they, and so good they wanted you themselves. Yeah, which, <laughs> which is great. It's worked out, yeah. But for me, but for me you know, our role as finance people in recruitment is not to stifle the entrepreneurial flair of the business. Yeah. It's to create structure and process from, let's just say, the craziness that you guys create. Yeah. Um, and... Um, and making sure that we're allowing the sales teams to go out and be entrepreneurial, be really sales focused, but making sure we're keeping everything safe behind the scenes. So the class, that classic gatekeeper finance person just doesn't work in the recruitment space. Yeah, yeah. You end up creating far too much of a them and us type culture yeah. if you get the wrong person doing that role. I think it's a really interesting, and, and it was, it's only th on, on very recent conversations I've had actually where I've looked at the, the, this sort of thing, and I think some of the things we've been talking about historically have been the importance actually in, of, of, of you know, a finance person about how much money it can actually make and how much money it can actually save with it, and that should be the role of, of someone in, that, in this space, in this industry, right? Absolutely, and I think uh, your classic finance role is to come in and look at cost and, and and bring those operational costs down. Yeah. Whereas actually the lion's share of our of our costs in a recruitment business are sales staff related. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually a big believer, I take a very non-finance view on that. Actually, we need to be looking at, um, at our remuneration schemes to make sure actually we're competitive in the market. And the smaller the brand potentially, the more you need to pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, so, uh, but, but on the flip side, I think we can also really add value to the to the top line yeah. and teaching consultants around the impact of margin growth yeah. um, and diversity of clients and yeah. actually looking to see clients that you've built with over the past four or five years to see where relationships have dropped yeah. um, to, to, to kind of really drive activity in the top line as well. I think that's a really interesting strategic piece, isn't it, of, a, of an FD in a contract business, of looking where opportunity is about seeing. And you know, on a on a day by day, you don't think of five pounds being a huge amount of uh, negotiation or a percent here or a percent here, but it aggregates massively, right? Yeah. And uh, and the amount of uh, extra revenue that can be built from the same sort of stuff is yeah. is is you know, 
kind of a, a huge inevitability if you actually get the right people looking at your book. But it's very, it's very easy for a consultant to look at their margin and think I've lost a percentage point over the last 12 months yeah, yeah. And, and for that to feel insignificant. Yeah. But then to show actually what, what impact does that have on you yeah. as an individual on your take home yeah. um, had you negotiated a little bit harder yeah. and then extrapolating that across the whole business, yeah. actually it can be quite significant numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and unfortunately margin deterioration is you know, quite often a one way street. Yeah, yeah it's difficult to move back up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> The other thing I really wanted to talk to you about was, um, you know, we, we were involved in a roundtable recently, <coughs> and the whole concept was about you know, value and, and creating value in a business and creating a great recruitment business. Um, tell me what you think a great recruitment business looks like. So, other than Harrington Star. <laughs> <laughs> so acro a across our portfolio of clients, the the ones that are doing the the best work are the ones that have really defined their niche yeah. and they've gone out to be famous in that marketplace yeah. and really engage with the communities that they're placing into. Yeah. So they're not that classic recruiter, um, they're that, they're, they've, they've kind of moved more into that trusted advisor role. Yeah. So for me, creating that niche and creating a reason why you're in that niche yeah. and what value you're adding to that is, is what differentiates our top performing brands. Yeah. So it's a niche first and being a specialist in the marketplace. And when we see a lot of people trying to be a number of different things, you devise against that then? Absolutely. Yeah. I think you know, it, it, a bit, it also depends on what your long-term ambitions are. Yeah. You know, if, you're, if you're looking to create capital value for a potential sale, yeah. the market at the moment wants niche. Then yeah. It's looking for niche. The kind of buyers that are in the market at the moment are, are picking that, you know, the, the guys that are getting the bigger multiples are the niche brands. Yeah. People aren't buying generalist recruiters necessarily at the moment. This, um, is, this is another interesting thing you were talking about with that because you see quite a lot of companies sort of go into fads. I mean, everyone went into oil and gas a couple of years ago, didn't they? Because oil and gas was uh, printing money and then all of a sudden everyone reversed pretty quickly back out, the, back, yeah. back out of that. But you see companies who, who do IT, who do HR, who do uh, legal, who do this, that and the other, maybe through different groups of you know, or companies or different faces on, of it. Yeah. Um, do you think it's best? You know, I think well, I think one of the things that sort of struck me with what you're saying is people don't look to buy a pharmaceutical company and a legal company. Yeah. Is that something you'd subscribe to still? Yeah, definitely. I think you know, just cre creating something nice and tight is yeah. is what people are looking for. But I think recruiters um, are can can often be guilty about going after the bright new shiny thing. Yeah. So you know, w when oil and gas was booming, actually yeah. you saw a load of IT recruiters moving into the oil and gas space. Yeah, yeah. But what you're doing is you're creating a business that doesn't necessarily make sense. Yeah. Um, Sustainability. And, and, and it creates it creates for your marketing team. Yeah. It creates that difficulty of like, what brand message are we taking to the market? Are we IT cons are, are we IT specialists? Yeah. Or are we oil and gas specialists? Yeah. But also for me, from a um, uh, bringing on new consultants, if you can give them a nice tight niche to work on, they yeah. can very quickly become experts in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've seen people that I, you know, start on day one, who I wouldn't necessarily rate. They've been given a really tight market to work on. Yeah. Have been trained really well in that market. Yeah. Within three months, they sound so credible. Yeah. And they're billing really well. Yeah. Whereas I'd have written them off on day one. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you give someone the whole market to go after, it becomes a much more daunting yeah, proposition. Yeah, that sort of generous thing, I think, is a very difficult way to recruit. And, and uh, you know, it goes back down to my, my starting 20 odd years ago, we were working at NT4 recruitment in Surrey. <laughs> yeah. the, the various, uh, KT postcodes were the thing there, but it meant that you knew ev absolutely everyone. You, you know, when you had a candidate, you were able to move it. It gives you speed yeah. and agility, doesn't it, to actually know that, that you know, alongside that knowledge. Go, go, going back to that bright, shiny thing yeah. I issue that, w that we mentioned earlier, as a finance person, it's your role to, to help the board define what the strategy of the business is, yeah, yeah. to create the three or five year plan yeah. f uh, around that strategy, and then to keep the business honest against it. Yeah. So actually, it's advising your CEO, yes, we can go and do that, that new business area that does look really exciting, but we'd committed to this. We'd committed to this path. Yeah. So are we saying we're going to change that three year plan now? Yeah. Or do we actually just need to make potentially let that opportunity go because it doesn't align to what to what we've um, what we've proposed as a board? And those plans are quite interesting as well, aren't they? Because they've got to be accurate. Um, and uh, I was uh, I, um, one of the takeaways I took from when we were uh, last speaking was if you've got a yearly plan and you, and you smash through it, it's not necessarily a good thing because it yeah. could have been the other way. <coughs> Tell us a little bit about what that means. 
Well, it, accurate financial planning. It, I, I think if you can if you can show that you can budget well, it shows you've got a good a good grip on 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 your business. Yeah. You understand the mechanics, you understand the drivers of growth, but also the, the you know the potential pitfalls. Whereas I think if you're if you're constantly putting forward a, a budget where you're taking over the world and actually yeah. you're 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 doing 10% growth year on year, yeah. um, then potentially if you if you're going into a sales scenario showing that crazy budget for next year, yeah. it's going to be easily chipped away at. Yeah. Whereas if you're ha going through a sensible budgeting process every year and tweaking that with the learns from each year, so actually you're getting better and better at it as the time goes on. If you find yourself in that wonderful growth scenario, you know, we've seen recruitment businesses in the past sold on forecast, yeah. but that only happens if you've been Showing very good at doing that forecasting in, in the prior years. Yeah. So, so, so within that sort of uh, niche, you know, you, you, and we talk about accurate forecasting, we talk there about niche a little bit and staying niche to where else. What else, what else uh, increases the multiplier for, for a business? I think it's be, being in a growth scenario as well. Mm. I think um, investors want to buy a business that, um, that still has gas in the tank. Yeah. And I think that's, um, that's something that a lot of recruiters struggle with. Yeah. It's thinking that actually, you know, I can see what the next 12 months looks like and the 12 months looks bloody good. Yeah. Let's stay for another 12 months and let's take bus the business to market at that point. Yeah. Whereas in reality, it's when you're going through that growth phase that you're most attractive to the outside market. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, one of the one of the key learns for me over the last kind of 15 years is the time to sell a business is when people are buying. It's not when you want to sell the sell business. Sell the business yeah. So I've seen some very, very good mi businesses miss opportunities mm. because they felt they weren't quite ready to sell because they still had said gas in the tank. Yeah, yeah. But um, but missing those opportunities. Yeah, and that's and that sort of thought process comes about because people are either being greedy about that that sort of stuff or just. I think I, I'm not sure it's greed. I think it's you know w when you're in a growth cycle in a business and you're an entrepreneur, yeah. that's a really exciting place to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you don't necessarily want to give up your baby. You know, you know, essentially, as an entrepreneur, your business is an extension of your family. Yeah. You don't want to give that up when you're going through a really, really exciting phase. Yeah. But the reality is, if you want to get the best multiples, that's the time to do it. Yeah. And we, and we spoke a little bit as well about you know, the sort of in incentive to um, sell a business. Um, I mean, for, for I've, I've had debates about this ever since we started eight years ago. And uh, people always say, right, what's your, you know, what's your exit plan? Um, when are you getting out? What do you want to get out of it for? And that's never been on the agenda as a, as a sort of driving force for us to say, we want to be out for this. We want to build a great business. Yeah. Where do you, where do you sit on that side? Absolutely. So I was having the conversation with a client this morning who who was saying to me, I'm I'm tired. I, I I want to be out of this industry in five years' time, and to actually sit down and say to him, right, you need to find you need to find your energy levels again, because if you if you create a business to sell, it's fundamentally going to have a short-termist view. Yeah. Whereas if you create an awesome business, then someone will come and want to buy it. Yeah. So create an awesome business. Yeah. And someone will buy it. Create a business to sell. I think you're less likely to get it away. Yeah, it's always. It's, I guess it's always troubled me a little bit when I hear about companies starting up saying, "Look, come into our, our startup business. We want to be out in five years for X amount, and this is what we're going to do it for." Because I think, I think there's an integrity part of that yeah. in terms of the promises that are made to people within it. I also then think it commoditizes every individual you've got in a business. So yeah, every, right, every aspect right. you're doing is not about the future of the individual. It's about the future of, of the founder, effectively. And that, to me, makes makes a, an awkward sort of. Uh, um, play to you know to anyone who who's coming in to work for your business. Yep. You're going to be working for a, a you know for anyone. But but there are there are businesses that have done very well with that methodology. Yeah. But I think where they've succeeded is actually aligning the goals of everyone within that business. Yeah. And sharing that option pool slightly wider. Yeah. So actually, if your if your drive is to get towards that exit, you kind of need everyone to benefit along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than just you as the entrepreneur. Yeah. Okay. There, there are other things that, that companies can do to really add value to, you know, to their, their proposition. Um, there's something I want to come on to in a minute, which is very much the sort of uh, the, you know, the back office side, which I think where, where you can really sort of come into your own about. What else do you see as, as, uh, as valuable um, multiplier increases on, on a business? We talked about 
um, sustainability of growth. We've talked about proven growth tra you know, track records. We've talked about international presence. We've talked, uh, spoken about the markets, the, you know, the specialist niches that you go into within that and the longevity. Um, can you build out on, on that a little bit further? I, I, it's, it's, it's kind of aligned to the growth, um, the, the growth piece as well. But for me, having a clearly defined methodology about how you go after certain parts of the market. So for you, having the Harrington Star model for growth. Mm. So looking to see, right, actually, we've got opportunities in this part of the market. This is how we do it. This is how we build the team around it. This is how we attack that particular part of the market. And you can see we've done it here, here, here and here. Mm. And it's been successful. Um, if you find yourself in that um, sales scenario, actually saying to someone, here's the parts of the market that we haven't gone after. Yeah, yeah. If you use our methodology, we've proved that it works. Yeah, Here yeah. are your op opportunities. And that's going to make you a lot more attractive than maybe a slightly more chaotic approach to growth. Yeah. So showing the growth so didn't, didn't happen by accident. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, that sort of uh, story to success effectively that can be uh, moved into you know, different market areas, you've got something there which people can buy into a little bit further and, and a story to take companies further forward. Yeah. Tell us about the, uh, the, uh, the back office side because it's an interesting part for me because you know, when, you, when you think about it initially with a naive sort of view, you think, right, okay, it's all about your numbers, it's all about um, being a fantastic sort of uh, looking business, but it can be absolutely swiped from underneath you if you haven't got everything absolutely. correct. You can, drop, you can <coughs> drop an awful lot of value in your business by not having the right yeah. um, you know, back office systems behind us. How, tell us a little bit more about that. So I, I would say this, but, <laughs> but, but your, your most important person at the point of sale is, yeah. your, is your head of finance. Yeah. You know, wh whilst, whilst the business that you've created and the management team that you've put together will attract the buyers in, the person that will spend most time through that due diligence process dealing with the potential acquirer uh, will be your finance person mm. and having good strong financial controls in place not just at that point but for years before is going to put you in really good in really good shape mm. so so much about buying a business is about confidence mm. and and if there's if there's chinks in the finance armor yeah which are very obvious it's actually it's going to cast doubt on the rest of the business yeah so making sure that actually you know, you've got someone sitting at the table with you who, who can deal with that process. It's got information. That's, just yeah, like, yeah, that's create, that's, that's um, you know, ha is, is running a really robust finance team. You've got a really solid balance sheet, mm. but also someone that's actually been through the journey with you. There's nothing more credible than having someone that you've grown and developed through that period mm. who's sitting there in front of a potential investor that's been through the journey with you, mm. who has three to five years of really good board information which backs up the story that you've been selling mm. um, so if, if i if i was uh, if i was doing due diligence the, the you know the obvious place for me to come and chip away at is is the finance team yeah i'd look at things like any tax dodges you'd been up to mm -hmm. any umbrella schemes you know all the all the really easy places for us to chip away at value yeah. and if we find something then we can, you know, we can extrapolate that across the wider business. Because that's and what they're looking to do in due diligence, isn't it? It's absolutely. not necessarily to disqualify it out. It's to looking to find it's things to there do which a can deal. It's chip, to get, it's chip to get the, deal the deal down. Yeah. And you can see multiples um, uh, dipping by up to twenty five percent just by the finance um, and the numbers and the and the compliance not being absolutely spot on. So that, that sort of time span you just said there, three to five years, is about the right sort of time scale, right? I think so. To see someone grow up and through, through that. Yeah, maybe three years would, would be the, probably the right time scale. So the interesting thing that, that there within it is, is that person to grow it and it being the most important thing becomes your, you know, one of your most important hires, right? Absolutely. And it isn't a hire who most recruiters are used to hiring. Absolutely not. So and the that's big, a very, so the big very question good point. becomes, what is, what is a, a, a great... FD. Yeah. What makes so, a great FD look so, like? So, so in the re in the recruitment sector, I think a lot of businesses make the mistake of hiring what they think their clients need. So they look for people that have had experience in large corporates, forgetting that actually they're a high growth SME business. Yeah. And the skill set and mindset to operate in a SME is fundamentally different to um, to operating in a large corporate. In exactly the same way as <laughs> as a recruiter, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And um, I was I was interviewing for a client recently, helping them to uh, to hire their first FD, and watching them get really excited about this guy, 
who was completely wrong for them, yeah. and they were pr you know practically high fiving each other as 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 the guy left the room, only for me to explain the drawbacks and the and the holes in his experience yeah. for what they needed there and then. Yeah. Um, he didn't get the job in the end. Yeah, <laughs> close but no cigar. But, but for me, but it's those sort of mistakes you can make, right? I mean, it, you know, when you talk about twenty five percent decreases in value in valuation based off having either no FD or someone who's wrong even more so. I mean it can be disastrous for a business. Absolutely. But but um so so one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing now is I found myself in a position in a very fast growing recruitment company mm. where I was the FD and I wasn't being fully utilized. Yeah. So so one of the issues you've got is if you get a big hitter to come in when you're th potentially three to five years out from a from a transaction, do they have enough to keep them interested? Do they have enough to get them, you know, get them out of bed and yeah, and, yeah. and jumping into the office each morning? Yeah. Whereas if you can find someone who actually can come in, can create an amazing team for you, and the team that's going to help you grow and develop as you go as you move towards an exit, but also has the potential to grow and develop themselves throughout that journey. Yeah. Not only are you saving yourself some money along yeah. the way, but you've got someone that's completely engaged in your business. Yeah, yeah. And and they've seen their career develop. They've with seen it. their career develop as yeah. your business develops and you've got a genuine right hand man. If yeah. you if you spend the time to invest in them um and um and kind of help them to go on that journey. Yeah. To me that's by far the best route. What would you if you were to pick sort of three traits what would you be looking for if you were interviewing an FD? What would they be? That's a very good question. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, it, in, a, in, a, in an SME recruitment business, I want to see someone that's got their hands dirty yeah. at some point in their career. Um, and, and, and probably I didn't get my hands dirty until I started my business yeah. and maybe didn't realise the importance of that and, until that point. Um, so, so that's really important. It's good academics, but then absolutely um, top of the tree by a country mile is does this person have the um, personality and the credibility to engage really well with salespeople? Mm. So for me in my business, my business would fly mm. if, if I had a queue of people out the door, a queue of accountants out the door that could do the numbers, mm. but also deal with recruiters. Mm. Um, and deal with the pace of recruitment. Yeah, it doesn't work hand in hand sometimes, does no. it? Yeah. So, so I, I often say that the, the success of, of a finance person in recruitment, maybe 30% of it is down to the numbers, yeah. and 70% is about how you engage with the wider business, right? how you manage the relationships, how you manage the speed and the pace of the industry, because yeah. it's not for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And so, so what... what um what does that personality look like? Because it's, uh, you know, again, we're talking about someone who's in engaging. And when you talk about speed, I presume it's about people wanting everything yesterday and, and uh, that demand from it all and, yeah. and, and probably having some sort of fairly uh, diva-ish people demanding X, Y, and Z and rabbits from hats and such. Like, Is it that durability we're talking about? Is it character? It's, is ca it it's, it's very much character. Yeah. It's someone who isn't going to be rocked by, by those kind of interactions, yeah. who's not going to be intimidated by... Um, by sales managers, sales yeah. directors who can actually stand their own, but actually it has the calmness yeah. to explain why they're putting certain things in place yeah. to be able to, to really engage well with the wider business yeah. and not be intimidated by the large personalities. Yeah. So, so much of it is what's in here. Yeah, and you've loved it. You've been, you, like Absolutely. you say, you, you originally uh, <coughs> dragged yourself reluctantly into the recruitment space and stay, <laughs> stayed with Absolutely. it. What, 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 what gives you your kick out of recruit, recruitment? So, as so, so, for me, I love. Um, uh, I love working with entrepreneurs. Like what, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm helping high growth businesses to, to grow in a profitable cash gener generative way. Yeah. Um, I love the energy that recruiters bring. I love the chaos that you create. <laughs> I love, and, and just going back to my original point, I love the impact that I can have as a finance person. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the more my portfolio grows, the more experiences I have within the industry, yeah. the more kind of sharing I can have with my clients around what the market's doing. Um, you know, try, you know wh one of the things we're trying to do is help our clients not make the mistakes that we've seen um, other businesses make before them. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and, and as my business grows and develops, it almost becomes more exciting as we do it yeah. because I've got more and more anecdotal evidence around what's good and, what, and what's not yeah. and what works and what doesn't. Yeah. So, 
yeah, it's, it's an exciting place to it's be. It's a good thing to build up. Yeah. So I want to ask you one, one last question, which is my favourite one to ask in these okay. sessions, uh, which is if you, could, if, you know, if you were to uh, have a recruiter or someone in the, in the industry come up and ask you, say, look, just give me one bit of advice, what would that bit of advice be? About, about growing your business? About growing your business, about, about the what? industry, about what, everything you've learned from being in recruitment. That's a really tough question. I'd say that I, I don't have one answer to it. I think I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to give. I'd like to give two. <laughs> so, so going back to a point that um, point that I made earlier, create a business that you're proud of. Yeah. Create an awesome business that um, that everyone is engaged in and driving and in, and enjoying the journey, and someone will want to come and buy that. Yeah. So don't be about going and creating a business to sell create that awesome business that, yeah. that makes you proud every time you walk in in the morning Yeah, because that's the one because not only is that journey going to be more exciting and you're going to enjoy it more along yeah. the way but you're probably going to get a higher multiple at the end yeah. of it once once someone finally wrestles it away from you there's people coming to you isn't it it's always better to be in that situation than trying to push something over the other side isn't it yeah absolutely and and my second thing and and i see this far far too often um, you know, we talk a lot about having a really solid second tier of management in a recruitment business mm. um, and everyone knows we need to focus on it, but I see so, so many mistakes there. And um, in, in my experience, the mistakes are creating a great team and then not allowing them the autonomy to step up into the roles that you want them to do yeah. is, is a big one. Yeah. Secondly, and, and maybe more importantly, is, cr is creating that second tier of management, giving them the role and telling them you're going to look after them. Don't worry, I've got the scheme in my mind, I just need to roll it out for you. You go and do this job and I'll look after you. Yeah, yeah. And, and in my experience, what that does, that creates an expectation, expectation gap yeah. between what that sales manager is expecting to receive yeah. and what the entrepreneur, the director is expecting to pay. Yeah, yeah. And, and far too often, I've seen the scenario where the directors are saying, don't worry, we're going to look after you. Yeah. And six months down the line, that's actually quantified and there's an expectation gap. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so for me, engaging... And you were talking there about the package and, and, and having the right sort of, the, the yeah. right sort of uh, uh, very clear uh, earning potential for someone spelled out, spelt yeah. out in front of them. So a manager comes in, knows exactly what they've got to do to, to get exactly what they've got. Yeah. And people, and people miss that, miss that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and it doesn't, come from, it doesn't come from a starting point of, uh, let's see what I can get away with here. Yeah. The, the, the directors genuinely believe they're going to look after these guys, yeah. but they haven't quantified it. Yeah, yeah. So spend the time, once you create that tier of management, spend the time to sit down with your finance guys to work out, right, what does that need to look like? Yeah. Because one of the hardest remuneration schemes to write is the biller into... Yeah. their first role in management. Yeah. Once you've done that, actually the next tiers become a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. But get it right. Work out, work out what your structure is going to look like yeah. and work out what those remuner remuneration schemes are going to be. It's the easiest word to say. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so that, so you're, you're all totally aligned yeah. with what you're, what you're trying to achieve. I agree with that. To, to, you, just to go back a, a, a slight step as well, you talked there about the autonomy to, to the management team and getting, uh, almost getting out of the way of that. Tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that. Um, so I've, I've seen a number of recruitment businesses plateau yeah. where um, uh, they've got a great second tier of management that just don't feel like they're being left alone to do their job. Yeah. So they still feel that they're being micromanaged either by the board or by the founders yeah um if you've got great people try and hire people that are better than you and get out of their way yeah yeah um yeah that's what makes businesses grow and flourish yeah so giving the people the chance to do that sort of stuff but, it's, the other not, it's, not, but it, you know, it's, it's not always about money yeah you know a, a lot of people are in this for for career development as well definitely and and going on that journey so yeah. that, you know, it's an interesting one to get right get right that isn't it because you talk talk there about the other side of uh yeah, the financial aspect of, of getting it right for you know people who are moving from building to management. The other side of it is there is an, it's a completely different job. Yeah. So the other side of autonomy is making sure you give people the tools to do that. And I think sometimes people can, can uh, say, right, there it is, this is your next job, get on with it. And yeah. it not only does it kill their career, it kills the career of the people underneath them pretty, qu pretty quickly. So I think it's a, you know, for me, I 100% agree with you. But I also think it's a fine balance between you know making sure those guys are match ready yeah. <laughs> for you know for that sort of uh, move backwards, and you give people clarity around what they you yeah, know what their what role is and what like. they want to do. Yeah. And I read a great article the other day on LinkedIn about 
um, about that scenario where how many of us found ourselves in our first management role thinking, I know how to do the jobs beneath me. Yeah. I have no bloody idea how to how to um, get the guys beneath me to, to do those roles now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, 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 um, there's, there's, I think there's a whole book on it called The Peter Principle about how people can move okay. themselves into that sort, of, uh, that sort of scenario where they sort of promote themselves into the, uh, into the position of not being able to do their job. And it happens all the time around it. And there's ways and means to get yourself into that mm -hmm. position to uh, make sure that people are supported all the way through. And I think if you can get that right, it's uh, hopefully uh, good news for everyone. And, and a, a lot of recruiters naturally try and push their big billers down to a management route. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in reality, the behaviours and the raw materials required to be a big biller yeah. are fundamentally different yeah. to those required to be a good manager. Yeah. So actually, it might be your average biller who's showing those characteristics. Yeah. It's having the confidence to take that person and develop them, yeah. rather than the easy choice is the big biller. Yeah, this, uh, it's, it's a very interesting one, that, isn't it? Because there, there, are, there are big builders who, who sort of do become great managers and, and they can do it because they've walked the walk. Yeah. Um, and there are big builders who are awful people to, <laughs> to, yeah. to, to work with and around. And then conversely, you know, if I can think of one of... Um, yeah, there's a person who I worked with many years ago who, who probably wasn't one of the, the, the greatest builders of all time, but he, he, He's you know, developed into in a in a big business one of the most important leaders in that company from being someone who, you know, would be a, a, at best a pretty av average biller at best, mm -hmm. became a, a wonderful leader because um, of some of the characteristics around it. So I think if you look at those characteristics and really work out what people need to do to to have followers, um, and get that early enough, I've made a mistake myself. You know, and I know, I know there's uh, there's someone here who who I think is going to be a, a far better leader than, than they have been a, a biller and we probably held that back a little bit mm -hmm. too long to, to really unleash it so yeah it's, it's a tightrope isn't it yeah <laughs> absolutely and and the thing is there's no right or wrong answer yeah what's right for one business find out one it, <laughs> yeah. what's right for one business is fundamentally wrong for another yeah well look, it's been a brilliant chat thanks so much for coming in no and uh and joining us today thank you all for watching thank you and uh we'll see you on another episode soon well thank you very much cheers, David. cheers.